Hey, welcome to Coffee Compiler Club. And in here today, normally to talk about all things to do with compilers and whatnot. And I, and in theory, I have a set agenda. I'm going to attempt to show how I'm doing reversing C of nodes back to a control flow graph. So this is going to be about scheduling in the C of nodes to get an actual control flow graph back. Um, I don't have any really prepared material. I have a bunch of windows open that I'm going to pop between. I have an ongoing conversation with a couple of people trying to make this work. So some of this may be a little disjointed and I apologize in advance for, um, you know, what the heck's going on here. So before I actually get going, is anyone else want to bring up anything before I start here? And that would be the big silence here and make sure Vivian, do you have sound? You can, you can say something. Yeah, sure. Hi. Yeah, sure. Hi. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. So um, let me attempt to, yeah, boy, now I'm now I'm leery about sharing a region of the screen again. I guess if I don't resize it, it'll be okay. Okay, let me go see. This is gonna come up, it's gonna be the wrong thing when I move and if it fails, I'm gonna have to exit, zoom and re-enter because it just crushed itself. Always share an entire screen. Any um, Anything else is long... doomed to pain. Yeah, it's a very large screen, and so I'm I'm getting close to like some sort of limit of YouTube regional formats. Um, let me claim here's an Emacs window. Here is an IntelliJ window. Is any of this readable now? I can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All I right. See, well, so I see the um, the IntelliJ. Looks like uh, four panes of IntelliJ. Right. There's a um, browser. I, I didn't think you used IntelliJ, Cliff. Um, let's not claim I use it intelligently, but you know, whatever. So let me let me pick one of several test cases here and start the the game. So I have a program here on the right in this green stuff. This is simple. And it says stupid things because it's a stupid test case. And, and then in the end, it ends with this key set of bits. And it's i equals v dot x. So this is a load from a structure called v. V's up here with a new s structure. Here's Levo. And then conditionally, I'm going to store v dot f to 1. And that one is going to crush So the f field. So I need to load before I store. Okay, and the the problem here in the sea of nodes, and you know the, the good and the bad is that the first thing that happens here is we throw away a lot of the anti-dependence edges. So there's no anti-dependences between the load at line 345 and the uh, and the store at line 346. So I'm going to this anti-depth one here. I'm going to uh, uh, bring up a graph. I had a bunch of breakpoints set that might be interesting. First, I'm going to bring up a graph, and we're going to see if I can do all this in a way that's visible. So here's a graph. I broke the fine details of presentation, so there are some clunky bits, but there's a key pieces here that we're going to go over. So is my mouse visible to people then? Yes. Excellent. So in the middle here, I have a couple stores, and the stores look like dot .f equals dot f equals dot f equals. Okay, well, the first new gets a dot f equals and the memory edge is broken because I broke it, so ignore that. But it basically uh, uh, stores a two down on some field. That's vf equals two in line 343 to the right. Then there's a new store initializing a zero for the second new on line 344. Then there's this dot f, which is a load as opposed to a store. And he pulls from the memory state of the prior store of the initializing write, and he's aliased because it's the F field, and there's no other alias sharpening going on. So he's confused and doesn't realize that he should have a two available to them because he's got two pointers to S fields, S dot F fields. So there's a you know people to clean this up, but I don't want to. I want this to be broken or or, or at least suboptimal because it forces the, the situation. And then the F uh, uh, now uh, cursor is now. 
Go ahead. Sorry, question here. Cliff, is are people clear about why there is no dependency between the load and the store and why we have only the uh, memory dependencies? Well, I, I'm about to go explain that we don't have a dependency between them. Okay. Um, but then, then yeah, then, then do people understand why there's no dependency and then why we need it? So we're going to put it back. So the, the dot F equals I'm on takes the blue memory edge from the prior store. And then it takes a value on edge number three there of the number one, he's writing a one end. And he takes a, a, a control because he got scheduled already at the time that this graph printed out. And then I have a load there to the left and he takes from the same memory state and he takes from the same pointer state and, and, and the real issue is he takes from the same alias. And that load and that store, they're side by side, they, they need an anti-dependence between them. They need something to help them in the schedule. So is, is it clear what my problem is now? Does everyone understand what I have a problem with? And then the, the, the flip side of that one is to understand how I got here. The problem is I got rid of the anti-dependence edge so that I could do optimizations around multiple loads of the F field and multiple unrelated stores to other things. <clears throat> and then when I unwind C of nodes, I need to, uh, I need to reinvent the anti-dependence edge. So that's the, the, the crux of the problem here. I want an edge between these two nodes that are side by side. And because of the nature of things, I can't see people's faces. So I have no idea if you guys are confused or it's all understandable. Okay, so I'm going to uh, take another look at this. So I'm going to I'm going to rerun. I'm going to go over schedule early, and I'll come around to that in a second. And I'm doing this so that I can get a uh, a pretty print that I'm going to look another way to view this. And that's here under Emacs. And I'm going to, I, I took one of these dumps already, so I'm just going to ignore what I did. And I cleaned this one up a little bit. So here is another dump. This is basic blocks are basically broken out. There is a start block, which I'm ignoring because it has constants and the projection of memory at the start of the world. And it represents that little start block picture at the, at the start of my diagram up here in the upper right, the, the start block here. So I'm ignoring that. Then I have a real first block. And in this block, there's dollar control at the start of the block, start of a program. There's a new store. There's another new store. There's a load. This is the not yet scheduled load in question. This is the one that gives me trouble. There's a condition that breaks me into, do I do the store or not? I've scheduled the store down here at block 18. There's an empty blank team. There's a fee. The dollar two means it's fee of memory alias two. It's the memory of the F field. And the fee function is merging the store value. That's the 22 here, reading these graphs. This is node numbers. Node 22 up here, node 92 is defined. And the other store value is the previous store up here, where I've initialized to zero some unrelated S field. So my poor load here, he, his only use, so he's he's node 16, his only use, if I search for 16, is down here in the return. So sort of technically, if I look at the load, I could move him down here, except that would be after the store, conditionally after the store, and that would crush that F, F field, and that's not legal. So he needs to have some something that forces him up here. So when I do this scheduling game, we're looking for all your defs and all your uses and trying to make sure you land between your defs and your uses. And the problem here is that I have an anti-dependence, an effective use by the store down here, 22, without an edge. There is no edge from the store to the load. So the, the, the core first cut obvious thing that the code motion algorithm does is he finds the, the lower bound of your uses from above and he finds, oh, you don't have any screen share for me. And he uh, so you can't see my hands waving around, I'm talking with my hands. And he finds the upper bound of your uses from below and he gets a line from low to high in the, 
and the program graphs. And then he walks the line, figures out where he wants to put the load. He gets some choices. Okay. So so let me step out one more step here. Could there I, is a control flow graph question? in the sea of nodes. It's, it's in there all along, it's never lost. It's just the same graph tech is used for standard data ops, the standard control ops. But I can always pick out a, a control flow graph. And when I start to schedule here, the control flow graph is like a skeleton of your program. It's um, hard Adrian, to please? remove it. Adrian has has a question. Yeah, he... yeah, just just quickly before you continue, can you just copy like the original source code maybe into the docs so I can take a look at it oh, well? Like, yes. It might be very useful. So I can look at that both of those. Yeah, 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 time. yeah. Because you guys get docs in parallel to my display. That's a good answer. Now I got to go find my docs window. So this is sort of the first program that we're looking at here Thanks. in the docs now. You want to um, in fact, in the, uh... because I'll, I'll just do the same thing here with the, here is a text dump, which I can put into the docs also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now that I'm looking at the docs, go back and forth a little bit here. Okay, so fine. So so the, the control flow graph I've written out in the, the second layer. Um, and so, and, and the labels are just the node numbers. So they're not labeled one, two, three, they're labeled six, 18, 19, but they're just labels, fine. But those are basic blocks. Uh, block 19 is empty, for instance, but it's there. There's no jump at the end of the block showing, but the predecessors in the block are listed out at the end. So that chunk there says label six, that's your predecessor block six. There is no successor block mentioned in this particular dumb dump that you can imagine. There's a, there's a jump to 23 here. And there's a jump to 23 here. And after you do some basic block layout, one of the jumps goes away and you flow through or whatever it's going to be. Okay, fine. I'm still left with what I do with my load relative to the store here, and I need to pick up an anti-dependence edge. So that's the, the complicated part. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back up. I'm gonna show you the basics of how I schedule things early. And this is an early schedule. And the early schedule is basically the bones of the control flow graph don't move. Everyone else is springy loaded and they get sprung up to the high as they can go. They get pushed to the top of the program as far as they can go till they bump up against a hard skeleton of the control flow graph. Then I'm gonna pull them all down as far as they'll go till they get bumped down below. And then in the ranges in the middle, I'll look for things that have the best place to put something, which is typically lowest execution frequency, so out of loops, and conditional. Down inside conditional tests and out of loops. That's the sort of general philosophy. OK. So at that point, I have uh, 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 the, the build CFG here program. I'm going to start talk, talking a little bit of code. I'm going to do a little bit of pre-work, and then I'm going to go schedule early because it's really simple. So um, this is called after I'm done with people optimizations, I'm done with any sort of classic core compiler optimizations, loop unrolling, uh, range check elimination that you get out of Java, all the, the tests you want to do things with, constant folding, all that's done. Now I want to go emit code. And code emission is going to be things like build control flow graph, schedule instructions, um, and then uh, register allocation and code emission. Okay, so uh, uh, first thing I'm going to do here is I have to deal with the, the later algorithms expect to see a well-formed control flow graph. And what I mean by well-formed, I mean it's rooted at start and it's terminated at stop. And in between start and stop, everyone is completely connected. So if you have an infinite loop where at start, you branch off to an infinite loop that spins forever and never goes down to stop, the algorithms break because they are just graph algorithms and they walk a graph, but you can't walk from below and get into an infinite loop because it doesn't reach down. So I want to fix that. There's also unreachable code from above, which might be an infinite loop that would flow into the stop, but you can't get into it. It's dead. But being an infinite loop, it's not obviously dead to a local trend, a, a local optimization. To find any of these infinite loops, you can never do them locally. They have to be done with some sort of global search. OK. So in the programs we're going to look at today, I'm going to claim that's already been done. Fixed loops just finds my infinite loops uh, and takes care of them, does something to connect them or get rid of them. 
Okay, so I don't want to talk about that one per se. If we find time, we will. Um, if you don't write infinite loops, this won't be a problem. Yeah. Um, and of course, people, every scheduler on the planet, every every server on the planet runs in an infinite loop doing I/O. Those have uh, those do need to get fixed, which happens here. And the 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 fix for them is just make them appear to be not infinite anymore. But like I said, I'm not, not going to go through that one anymore here. Okay, are we good so far with what I'm doing here? And the one thing you guys can't do, and I can't get easy here, is okay. Participants. I either see faces or participants, not both. It sucks. Fine. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to schedule early, and this is where I'm going to try and push things up in the program as far as they'll go uh, up against the bones of the of the program. And to do that, I'm going to do a graph walk. And every time I do a graph walk, when there are cycles and repeated things, there's a visit bit of some kind. And the visit bit is the bit set there. And I start with a visiting set where I do a test and set. Have so I been here walking, before? Sorry, I just wanted to mention you're walking bottom up, right? From start Yeah, I was to... going to hit that right in a second here. So okay. good point. I started schedule early by passing in the stop node. So I'm starting at the stop node. After my test and set, say I haven't been here, I walk in that inputs. I'm walking backwards. And I'm getting notifications that can go away. Thank you for going away. It's probably being shown on your screen. Okay. So the backwards walk is saying, uh, uh, schedule somebody earlier. If I have inputs that are not yet scheduled, schedule them early. Because I don't know how early I can go until my inputs are all scheduled early. So grab my inputs. I'm going to ask if uh, I have it. Sometimes I have null inputs because inputs are ordered and placed. And sometimes there's a few places where they're null. I don't need to walk around back edges because I'm going to schedule early, ignoring back edges. Um, all things on the back edge will get scheduled um, as early as they can. But if you have a loop that cycles around and you have things that are on the back edge, uh, they don't need to cycle back into the main part of the loop and then try to claim those need to get scheduled early first. So you have to break loops. And that's the loop breaking right there. And then I go, oops, all right. I hit fingers off a button. So I missed, let's see here. Doom, doom, doom. Yeah. I go schedule early on. Well, if I look at my def here, this is the return. So from stop, I found a return. I'm going to schedule early, comes back in. I get another def. From this def, I have a region. And, and this is going to repeat. I'm going to go walking up, 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 up until I hit start. And eventually, I'll hit here. What Sometimes, does mean? What does schedule mean in this context? It means I'm going to schedule you as early as I can. I'm going to push a node up to the earliest place where his only thing his inputs are are things that have already been scheduled. And the only thing in this whole program that's been scheduled is the control flow graph. So I'm going to run until I hit something that his inputs are only control flow graph inputs. Mm -hmm. Or like the start node is scheduled early. But the whole okay. control flow graph is scheduled. The schedule is, uh, you know, it's like the order in which you want to execute the instructions. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. I'm 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 so, turning a graph C of nodes, an unordered graph, into a control flow graph with instructions per basic block, like a classic compiler. Mm -hmm. So, if I understand this right, you're adding control flow edges for all the nodes that do not have them already. Yes, I'm okay. That that is coming up. Yep. And that will be the 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 choice I will pick when I have a choice will be as early as possible. Schedules are uh, like a steps step in a, in a recipe by which we will be execute the program. Correct. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. When I'm done, this will be a classic pile of machine code assembly code that you yeah. could walk one instruction yeah. at a time. Classic von Neumann, one instruction at a time. Okay. So the key thing is that in the sea of nodes, you don't. It's like you don't have that defined, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The exact execution order is not defined. Yeah. Um, the semantics are there, but no exact, yes, but no exact order. That's correct. Yeah. 
things could be done out of order. And in fact, the existing simple has an execution engine, which picks an order that's not the order I'm picking right now. And that's also a legal order, the one that it picks. Yeah, okay. yeah, but, okay. All right, so I ran on until I couldn't find anything earlier. And what I have here is in is my start node. I hit the start of the program and the start node is already scheduled. So that test doesn't do anything. I'm going to ignore loop depth, which is a separate phase that I've fused in. And I'll talk about it as a separate thing. So I'm going to go find somebody else. So when I unwind from here, it's ignoring loop depth. Unwind from the start node. Start was walking his inputs. He just finished. He goes to the next input on start. Of I'm sorry, the control projection at start. This would be the, the first real block head. And he has no other inputs. So now I'm going to try to do the real block head. But he's control flow. He's already done. So I'm going to ignore him and so on and so forth. Until I get to somebody who is not. Now, what is this projection? Oh, this is argument. This is my window's really tight here. Can I make argument visible a little bit? He's also pinned because he's a start of the program. He's not a control. He's data, but he's pinned, so it doesn't do anything. So I'm going to skip until I find somebody who is neither a control flow graph and also not pinned otherwise. This test here could probably be replaced with an is pinned test, Debian do. That would got added a little later, and so I could probably clean that up a little bit. After rolling around, I come to this store dot f equals two. The no number is 12. I'm going to bring up the this guy. This is this first store here. So at this time, this store is not yet scheduled. The new so is this forced. is the this is 343 line in the source. Yeah, yeah, it's line three, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure. Yes, it is. Okay. So I'm going to schedule this guy, and I'm going to do an earliest possible schedule. So going back to this guy, he's going to say, um, I'm going to walk all your inputs. I'm going to grab the first one first, and then I'm going to start at two, three to the end. Every input, I'm going to grab his choice, that dot in zero of where he got scheduled early. And then I'm going to say, are you actually earlier using immediate dominator depth? I'll cover that more. And then when I get whatever I choose in the end, I'm going to set your slot zero, your control edge to the early. So that's the high level picture. Grab the first guy on the store. I just wanted uh, to add here that, you know, the input zero is the control flow that came out of C of nodes, right? So it's the, the control, um, yeah. I guess portions where, are all for the, threaded through. Yeah, slot yeah, zero. Yes. For the nodes that don't have any control yet, it'll be null. Yeah. And for the other nodes, they they have a control there. Control is you know a CFG node, right? Yeah. Just for clarity for other people who might not be aware. Yeah, thank you. Um so the first thing I grabbed on his input one, which is the uh, memory state of the start of the program. And that's input zero says I went to, I get scheduled to the start node. So the memory state at the start of the world is in the block of the start node. Know, that's pretty easy. And then I'm gonna grab his next input, input number two. And input number two is going to be your pointer. And the pointer is, the new and the new was forced into the dollar control block, which is a little bit below start, but it's basically a start block. And um, it turns out that that's a little tighter than start. So I'm going to grab immediate dominator depth here. OK, so now let's talk about immediate dominators. In in all uh, uh, in well, well shown in compiler theory is this notion of dominators and immediate dominators. And a node dominates another node in a graph. So this could be control flow graph or C of nodes, any kind of graph. One node dominates another. If every path from the start to the second node must go through the first one. Um, so let me go pull up the graph here. 
maybe that's a good way to show immediate dominators. Where'd my graph go? How come my graph is hiding from me? Because it's here. I got too many windows here. So I'm trying to do this f. So dot f equals with its storing of a two. And he's already known that the new s has been put in the block that's in parallel with this line here. And his, uh, I'm, yeah, and his memory, his original memory state here, which is the broken 28, that's where I broke it, the, the graph dump, give you and do, I, I, it's one of my to-do lists here. Found it this morning late, that's why it's not fixed. Should be pointing at the memory state up here at start, which is this dollar two. It's the second alias, so that's where it should be pointing at. What I want to say is every path from, uh, uh, from the start to new goes through start kind of trivially. But in general, if I look at something uh, at some point way down here and I want to ask, does this new post dominate or do uh, dominate this dot F down here? I have to say every path from start to F goes through and there is a path that would skip it. So it does not, new new does not dominate this F. Is that computed on demand or it's computed as okay. an old construction? Uh, yeah, I'm, it is computed on demand and I'm going to compute it in a second. Um, if I restrict myself to control flow graph only, then this does dominate. The, the, they're in the same basic block. I can't skip them. So let's go back to what am I doing with dominator depth? Okay, immediate dominators form a tree. Um, uh, and and the dominator, I guess the dominator is a whole former tree, and immediate dominators are just one step in that tree. And then because it's a tree, you can have a depth in the tree. And so uh, because they're going to dominate the, the 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 guy who I'm looking at right now in, which is the store, his inputs must have been able to dominate him because that's how the program is written. He can't be here unless there is a point which comes after all his inputs that dominates this guy. And, and that means that if I look at my dominator tree, there is a low point that I can draw a line going up the dominator tree where I'll cover all my inputs. I can't make a graph that way from, or, or I've made an incorrect graph if I have. So if you if you screw something up in a peephole in the parser, you get a broken graph, you can't do this. In a well-formed graph, it must be there. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk from the second guy I got up looking to see if he's a little deeper. So a little greater depth. And I'm going to repeat this until I find the deepest input. And that would be the guy who is so far down in the program, that's the as low as he's going to be. And then the store will abut right up next to him. All right. So I'm going to walk this loop once, and then I'll walk showing you what eye depth is doing internally. So I get an eye depth out of this. Um, I guess I can go ask the question here. It's usually cached, and then that's lazily computed. So here's a sample. There's a couple of different ways to compute. If it's zero, it's not yet found, and I have to go compute it. It is, in fact, currently zero. I guess we can go there. And if otherwise, I'll take the cache. To do this, I have to go find my immediate dominator of this control proj and ask for his depth recursively. And then your depth is one more than your input's one. So I'm going to go up and say, what's the immediate dominator of a control projection? It's always his slot zero because he's just a projection from the guy above. So it's always input zero, cast to as a control node. So then from there, I'm going to be asked for your eye depth. Well, this is the eye depth of start, and the immediate dominator depth of start is always zero. Top of the top of the tree. Coming back, I'm going to add one. Coming back, I got a one. And then I'm going to ask for early, which is basically off of start. Starts always a zero. One is greater than zero. So in fact, I'm now deeper. And I want to say, Oh, I can't put the start the store node up against start. The best he can be is up against dollar control, the first basic blockhead. Then I'm going to finish these inputs, and now I'm going to grab like uh, what am I up to? Three here. It's just like the value. It's the constant two. Constant two is up against start, but it's already deeper than that, and I'm out. So I claim this store has to be in the start block. Very sort of very trivially. And I'm done with that guy, and I'm going to go on to whoever's next in my early set. So let's go find somebody else. Here's the second store. Well, his inputs are going to include the first store. 
So we're going to have an early of start of the of the dollar control first basic block. I get input off of the same exact guy. I get an input off of start, and I'm done. It's the first block. So it's pretty boring. Here's the load. Okay, the load gets a little more exciting. The load has a first guy at start, and that's because his first guy is uh, a prior store. Let me go break that open. Here's the load. His input number uh, one, I just looked at. I did look at one. No, I, yeah, I looked at one. It's this store. This is the initializing F to zero that's causing me my issues and uh, as a whole. His input zero has been set to the first block. So my first input comes from the first block. I grab my second input. What's my second input? It's coming from the first block. What is it? It's the pointer, the new. It's also that first block. Done. Okay, so the load has an early of the first block. And in fact, most things have an early of the first block here in this particular uh, in this particular program. So let me let me finish early and now print. And that print is exactly the one you have here, except that the store here has been not moved down yet. Um, I could do that in the docs instead. That's probably a better answer. Where did the docs go? That's what I'm confused by. Okay, yeah, here. This store down here, I'm doing early schedules. He's still up here. And that's how early schedule works. So of here left pending unanswered. I didn't talk about loop depth. I didn't talk, I didn't show immediate dominators on something more complicated. I can do both of those or we can go on to late scheduling. And then I can't see faces. So people have to say something if they're interested or we'll go on to late scheduling. Yeah, I think the loop depths can be covered separately afterwards, right? Because it's kind of not related to this. Yeah, it's until... not related. Yeah. I fused an unrelated pass to avoid walking twice. And in fact, I could probably do a better job fusing it and fold it in a cleaner and it would be even less code involved, but it doesn't make the graph. It makes the algorithm more subtle because you're doing two things at once. They're unrelated. Okay. So uh, I can also, I know... Um, I know, Theodore, you were talking about immediate dom Somebody's talking about dominators computed lazily. You want to see how that's done? Yeah, why not? Well, or or head on to late scheduling. Depends on what people want to see. Well, that's what I'm asking you for, your people. <laughs> okay, so go. Uh, let's let's see how, how you compute lazy. The you, you want to see the immediate dominators before yeah. late scheduling here? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back. Let me go find uh, immediate dominators. Where's the, the this one is here. Here, 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 here. Okay, so there's a couple different things that are going on that we're gonna hit with immediate dominators. I don't know how can I cover all the overrides. Here's loop. And how do you go back? Is there a way to do this like a block once every every guy? And start and stop are very dumb. Um, I guess we haven't done stop yet. Well, it's, you see it says return null. Uh, technically, it could be. No, it has to be return null. It is not. You shouldn't be asking the question. Okay, so let's go stare here. Oops, where did it go? How did I not hit any breakpoints? Restart here, yes. No, why am I not hitting any breakpoints? Because I don't have anything exciting. I should have had region breakpoints. Where did my region breakpoint go? Yes. Oh, because uh, the depth on region can take a shortcut. Okay, fine. Um and where is we need a different program to show the complicated bits here so stepping through i depth of zero means not yet computed 
and I'm going to compute you. And then in some cases, I'm going to ask for your dominator and your dominator's depth. And I know for this control prod, we just stepped through that one. He's going to go to start, starts going to start zero. He's going to add one to zero and become a, a two. All right, starts going to return, yeah, he's going to be one. And, and everyone else will be greater. You, let's leave, let's mark you as well. Let's see here. Can I just continue on? Yeah, so this is me asking for the control proj, which I just did, and then I'm going to try again. Here's another one. I don't want to start here. I want to start at some place that's computing it. Wow, this program just doesn't hit it. No one asks for the immediate dominator uh, at this point. Let me see if I hit it for the next part. Oh, I do. But he is the true of 18 here. Okay, and let's go to this guy. What is the immediate dominator of this? Okay, well, that would be whatever the immediate dominator is. It's going to be this if, and his if's immediate dominator is going to be this control. So these things are forming a tree. I'm just walking up the line of the tree. The part where it gets weird is when I hit the region down here, and I'm hoping we're going to hit it in a minute. I'll step through this briefly. It should go pretty quick. I'm going to say, give me your immediate dominator, which from this true is his input zero, which is in this array list, his input zero is just the if. So he's the true side of the if. Returning it, he says, okay, I wonder why IntelliJ has you grayed out. I'm, I'm doing whatever I'm doing in the late schedule where I've grabbed some dominator. I'm going to go do some other things with it. Um, I'm, I'll talk about that when we get there. Let's go look at more dominator calculations. Is this another one that's going to be not doing it recursively? Yeah, one step. It's all one step here because this is all too easy. Where do I get the region? Let me go see if I finally get to the region. And I did. Okay, so now let's talk about dominators from the region here. Um, I have a stupid cutout because I wrote this a long time ago. There's really a for loop here instead of a one, two. If your region is broken and you have exactly one input, that's your dominator. You must, you only get to the region by going through your one input. Um, if you have three or more, you need a loop. I don't have it because I didn't need it because we had structured control flow and simple, but in general, I will. Otherwise, I need to take the least common ancestor of both of your inputs, immediate dominators. So let me go step through that. So get me the edge number one. Hello, IntelliJ. Give me edge number one. Edge number one, which is going to be something he returned, it's going to be the true side for the for the test. Give me edge number two. It's going to be the false side. Okay, so I'm asking for the immediate dominator of my two of my inputs in the, in the program graph. So here's the algorithm. The algorithm is going to say, uh, uh, walk up the deepest guy until your depths tie. Walk up the tie depths until you hit the common point. That's your immediate dominator. So let's go look at the graph version for a second. Maybe that makes sense. Here's the region. What's his immediate dominator? Well, you go up his two inputs. One's the true and one's the false. You walk up them in parallel until they tie and they tie at the if. That's your immediate dominator. What it means is any path from start to region will have to go through the if. It won't have to go through the true because you might go through the false side. It won't have to go through the false because you might go through the true side. But it must go through the if. So the immediate dominator is the if. Okay. So, so it's back. like a point. It's like a point of the program that because you don't have, uh, you don't know that you're in a true projection or false projection, but you are hitting the if no matter what. So this is a point in the program that has to be there. Yeah. So if I need to do a calculation before the region, the only place I can put it that is before the region is at the if or before the if. So the notion of bubble uh, bubbling up is that uh, they are tracing back to the start of the program. The, Correct? The, the whole dominator tree makes it back to the start. The immediate dominator is, yeah, taking one step, but you have to go through that if and then whatever one steps you have to go through to get before you hit all the way up to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so then the, the walk is simply 
while the left-hand side is not the right-hand side, figure out which one's deeper. And that tells me whether I should bump left or right or both. And then those are recursive and cached. And here they're, they're tied. So they're both at the same depth. So I'm going to walk up both steps, left and right. And they both, taking the one step up, hit the if node. And then I've got the if, and that's my media dominator. So in more uh, um, programming language lingo, the owner of the true and false projection is the if. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So but but like this a... is a graph algorithm. So okay. ignoring the names true, false, and if in any arbitrary graph, yeah. this technique works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's it's more generalizable notion. Of yeah. This. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then that's how region, and then region's the only other one who's interesting. Everyone else has one control input and they form a chain, and so just the line going up. When you get to a region, life gets weird and, and the, the calculation gets exciting. So that's, yeah, that's how immediate dominators work. In a quick, uh, quick, uh, the long liner, why we need the, the dominators? Okay. So, uh, they're used all over scheduling. <laughs> that's the that's the quick one liner. Okay. Let me, let me go find here is schedule early. Schedule early is using them. Immediate dominator depth is being used to say what is the uh, a deepest point in the program that is just barely below the last of my inputs, the deepest of my inputs. What what does it what decisions drive this? So well, this is um I want to find how high I can lift things. So the great, the great big picture, global code motion says, lift everyone as high as possible. They get hung up on the bones of the control flow graph and can't go any higher. Lift Drop, high. Lift, lift them high. up towards start. Lift them high. Okay. Lift them towards start. Okay. Push everything as high as you can towards start. Maybe then, show the show the graph. Um that might yes. help. No? Okay. Yeah, maybe. So here. I, I, they, is oh, like this start. particular program yeah, yeah. doesn't have a lot of control flow graph to screw with you. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm pushing things up. When I look at the, the store, his inputs are a prior store who comes from a new, which is in the first block. His prior input is a constant, which can be pushed as high as start. His prior input, his other prior input is a, is a pointer of a new, which comes as high as the first block. He could be in the first block. A uh, dumb could... question. A dumb yeah. question. What's the what are the constituent parts of the control flow graph? What... Okay. Yeah. So in this particular case, yellow start is a control. Dollar mm -hmm. controls that first head of the first uh, basic block. Really, there is a a mini basic block between start and control that hangs onto like all the constants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Things that have cool. no will never have a predecessor edge. Yeah. Yeah, so think of it this way, you know, the the, the yellow bits here are the, the control flow, bits. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all the other nodes, which are kind of floating on the left-hand side, they have mm -hmm. to be attached to one of these yellow ones. Because, right? because, because? Because that's where they will be executing, right? So now the so, question is, where do you put them? And what Cliff is saying is the initial early schedule, what it tries to do is tries to say, okay, how, so can I put, where can I put these nodes so they are highest up in the graph? Like, mm -hmm. can I put so, everything uh, in start? If uh, not, if if I can't put everything in start, can I put some things in control? If mm -hmm. not, if not, then something has to go with if. You know that it's like you're trying to push things as high as possible because in because, the graph because 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 that's you're that's the earliest find... point you could execute. Right? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So the big picture here is I'm trying to find where is a good place I can execute. I have choices. So uh, a constituent of a control flow graph will be kind of execution point of something in the program. So yeah, yeah okay. I can't. So if here, if you have to, you have to materialize the if in some kind of instruction, you have to materialize uh -huh. them in yeah. a, in a program execution steps. So that's one, that's why I'm getting, that's why I'm asking the questions because yeah. I, the if has okay. to appear. It has now, to appear as a cool. as a step in the program. Yeah, there'll be a there'll be a branch there. Okay. Yeah, that, that they. That, this is the 
this is the abstract interpretation of the program execution, and then they yeah. materialize uh, like instructions for each target th that you want. Yeah, mostly okay. the nodes in black will all turn into an actual instruction. Mm -hmm. The if will turn into an actual instruction. Yeah, the true and That's... the false represent jumps. This is that kind may or may not happen according yeah. to this... how basic blocks get laid out. This is kind of interesting because you're modeling the pro the if statement as if if it's execution in a true branch, then you try to model that. And if it's execution in the false branch, then you try the, to model that. But because you don't know which part to take, you model them both. So if you know, you can you can eliminate one of the branch. But if you don't know, you have to execute the both branches to materialize the both. Yes, this is, I mean, the whole point of every compiler IR is abstract interpretation of the program. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. that's what I'm, that's the gist. That's the gist. Okay. Okay. And then we're, we're, we're taking that abstract interpretation and making a concrete representation that I can run on an x86. Oh. So another thing, I, maybe another point to make it clear is like in this diagram, like, you know, the left hand or the nodes on the left, they're kind of floating, right? They're not attached. But if you look at the text output that Cliff uh, showed, Mm -hmm. uh, your in IR output, oh, yeah, then yeah. what you will yes. observe is that all the nodes now are, so the label at the beginning start is like where all these nodes have gone. So the first five nodes have gone under start. Mm -hmm. See, previously they were all floating, right? Mm -hmm. Then the next, uh, whatever, however many yeah. nodes Once have there, gone under yeah. control, yeah. So, right? So, so previously so they were all floating, but now they've been attached. So one yeah, of those this yellow is, boxes. In the gist of it, this materializes the execution of the program. So this this chains chains the program together. This kind of stitches the program together, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nodes that were free floating are getting pinned into basic blocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So they are getting from fact, some abstract notion of the program to a more concrete notion that's that's that begins to talk about things in the program. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the things you can observe here is that all these nodes in this mm -hmm. block six all have a six in the first column. That's their mm -hmm. slot zero. Mm -hmm. and they've been scheduled in block six. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's when you see scheduled. when when we say scheduled, this becomes a point in the program, our execution point in the program. Yeah. If I were to naively generate hardware instructions. Mm -hmm. Then a new would be a bump pointer uh, and get an address, and yeah. then I would store a zero yeah. or a two in that F field, and then I make another bump pointer, and then I just store mm -hmm. a zero, mm -hmm. yeah. and then a store is, of a whatever. This, how, how these how these abstract instructions mean to to a pro, to a processor or uh, right. to a right. execution? Layout. Oh, I see. The layout cut and paste didn't, didn't do well. Fine. Okay, cool. I think I got it. Cool. You think you got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. I have cut and pasty bugs between whoever, right? Um, yeah, okay. okay. What were we up to? We were it talking okay. Immediate dominators. So yeah, well, I think well, I'm done with immediate dominators. Okay. Yeah. So the other topic you want. And then well, I, that's I had one question. late, and that's where life gets gets more complicated. Sorry, I had one question about the immediate dominators that how, uh, like, in simple, is this accurate always? Like, the in, the way we are doing it is always so, going to be accurate because we don't have weird control flow. Is that correct? Well, okay. So the, the immediate dominator calculation and the immediate dominator depth are, are handled a little bit, uh, a, little, a little different here according to what phase of the universe we're in. So while we're running peepholes and deleting edges, your immediate dominator can change fairly radically. So if you have a control flow graph diamond and you cut one of the edges because some true, some if statement becomes always true or always false, then the immediate dominator will change, can change radically. So it is continuously incrementally recalculated on demand as you edit the graph. Whereas the depth, I keep a, a, an approximate, conservatively approximate value for. So the depth is always greater or lesser correctly, even if I chop edges in the graph. 
which means the depth may not go up by one, it may go up by bigger counts if you if you cut things, if you if you edit the graph. Right. But it's monotonic. So regardless of all the peepholes, it will still be correct. Um at, this at, is the bit I, I, I find I mean I mean it's quite complicated, right? To understand why this is true. Well he has to go one more time through the loop to get that final stable value, right? Well, once I've done editing the control flow graph and the graph isn't moving anymore, the cached values of the depth will retain their correct monotonic order and the immediate dominator will always become a, a one, one step, two step kind of calculation. And I could cache it at that point um, because it won't change again. So there is a slightly more complicated version of this that says, I'm done running peepholes that delete control flow graph edges. Every time I now compute a control flow graph, I can cache it and I don't have to ever ask it again. And it's always cheap to ask, except at regions where you might have to walk sort of an arbitrary amount of graph. And if you cached it, then you're gonna walk it once and it's a linear in the size of the program and you're done. Um, so do you reset the, do you reset the cache depth then each time to the to the top loop? To the I, I do not because I because I keep the depth uh, 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 monotonically correct. It's just not a count of one always. Well, that's the, that's the clever bit, right? And that's a bit that's hard to kind of understand why it's correct. So when you have a a a merging of a of a large region. A tree, a region which merges some complicated graphs, which has more regions and more and more and more. If you look at how I compute the depth, it's max over inputs, not min over inputs or smallest input plus one or something, it's max. And what that means is however deep you got on one side, the depth I give you is deeper. And if you were later in life to cut the other side, so suppose I walk the left-hand side, it's big and huge and complicated. I have many tree steps, immediate dominant tree steps. So I get a depth of 17, something, I don't know. And then I walk the right, and it's a direct hook straight up to the dude, to some if. And so it would be one more than the if. It's a depth two, so it would be a three, and I got 17 left, three on the right. I take the 17, okay. Then later in life, I cut the false side, the right-hand side of the if, and that three goes away. What's the dominator tree from the region? Well, the region lost an input. It becomes a, a simple straight up thing. It folds away eventually. But his dominator there is just the left-hand side, who's already at depth 17. So he better be one more. He better be 18. So I had the dominator depth by the amount of whatever dominators I got on the left and right. You know, the, so the this, worst this case so right. Am I correct in thinking that this can tolerate deleting stuff, but not adding stuff into the graph? Yes. Uh, right. If, so if I were to insert and... control flow in between, yeah, it if... wouldn't work. Yeah, I have to find a, a, a number in between I, I dominator depths if I'm going to add control flow. So if I look at how people's run in like C2, I don't add control flow. That's like a bad plan generally except when I do things with loops and I unroll and peel loops. And at that time, I reset those depths in C2. But you don't add control flow. It's like going counter <laughs> counterproductive here. Okay, scheduling error. What does this um, mean? You got scheduling error, you got scheduling error. You'll fix your bugs, right? Hmm. So, under under the theory that I'm not got other bugs, then those are themselves. This lets me delete edges safely incrementally. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a very, uh, there's a lot of papers on this as well, incremental dominator calculation, right? So it's not a straightforward thing. <laughs> well, when I did it in C2, there weren't no papers. And I winged it, but it didn't seem too hard. So, you know, done. Now, now you can go read papers and get the theory. Uh, for me, the code is small. It's it's like simple, straightforward, small code. Um, there's some theory there, yeah. But like I said, it's safe to go delete these edges with the depth, but you have to recalculate the dominator, 
which is why I don't cache it in simple. I cache the depth, not the dominator, um, because I, I mostly need depth for monotonic properties. Who's deepest? Find the max over the depths. And I don't care if they're off by one or off by 17. It doesn't matter. It's just who's the deepest. Whereas the dominators, you want to know who's the immediate dominator, and you have to recalculate every time you delete an edge. You lose that cache when you delete an edge. Okay, fine. That means that I'm not caching it at all in simple, but we totally could cache it once we stop deleting edges. Somebody was going to say something? No. Oh, all right, I'm going to oh, go back. Carry on. Yeah, carry ready, on. To, ready to go try again here. Schedule early. Yeah, we did schedule early. Mm -hmm. So that's your bones of your program get lifted up as high towards stars you can go to hit the bones of your your the skeleton of your program you know your mm -hmm. control program now mm -hmm. you're going to okay. go as late as possible because um, again hitting the control flow graph bones and in between early and late you have a range and the point of this is to find a good place in the range and a good place in the range is not in a loop for instance so my little test program here doesn't have a loop we can find a program that has a loop um, but we're going to first do late, and then we'll talk about, you know, where you pick. So running, schedule late. What's schedule late do? Schedule late starts at the start. <clears throat> he makes a side array because array list, because I hate you, Debian do, I don't. But array list, like, throws concurrent modification exception on me, and I don't want it to, and I don't need it to. And to avoid a stupid thing with array list, I made a side array. That's the late array, which says, how late can I put somebody? Um, and then I wanted to have a, a list of yeah. people I needed to go schedule late on, which is why I have. Sorry, I just wanted to array. add here. Sorry. That the early, so I just wanted to add here, the early schedule you had the, you were, you were able to utilize the slot input zero because yeah. that was available. Yeah. But for the late schedule, we need another place to hold in the, the schedule, information. In the late schedule, I need another place strictly to avoid a stupid thing with array list. If I got rid of array list and we put in, like I do an AA and some other places, I just an abstract, uh, uh, another kind of uh, iterator over an array, um, we wouldn't need this. Would you still go ahead and update the control input in the nodes? Yes. That's what happens right here. Mm. I, I have this okay. stupid extra two-step process to dodge using array lists. Oh, I see. Okay. Array list is trying to save me from myself. And because it's trying to save me from myself, I, I, my life got harder. If they quit trying to save but to me, myself, you know, to me, you know, would. having the two uh, two schedules anyway is useful for debugging and for other, um, other reasons, you know, it's, right? It's, you debug once and you walk away, and I, I just need to have. Uh, I don't find it useful for debugging. I, maybe you would because you're trying to understand how the algorithm works. Mm, okay. um, for me, I'm just going to use it as a. This is a is a workaround. Uh, work around for array list. Okay, so I have a place and we're doing a presentation. So it is useful in a presentation to show you the early and the late. The the node here, the NS array, that is just me having an easy way to set the slot zero for the chosen location after I'm done with scheduling. So I'm going to put the data into the late array, the late schedule in the late array, and then I'll, I'll fill it in into slot zero when I'm done. Okay. So having, having split that out here, let's go look at what happens. So there's a bunch of stuff in here. It goes on and on. Let's go talk about big pieces first. There is a, I've been here before. Every time you do a graph walk, you need a bit that says I've been here or not. So you don't repeat yourself. You get loops, you got diamonds, you got share DAGs, you have repeats, you'll go exponential or forever. You have to have a visit bit. I use the presence of fixing out where I'm going to put you as the present bit. Um, then there are some shortcuts. If you're already a control flow graph, you've already been placed. You're fixed. You're part of the, 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 the skeleton of your control flow graph. You, didn't, you can't go anywhere. And that means I'm going to set you right now. And there's a one little weird hat here of blockhead versus not the blockhead. And that's because I treat an if 
as a control flow node, but it's not a basic block head. And I will show you this and, uh, and this guy. Here I have an if, the number 17 node, it is a control flow graph related guy, but it's the tail, not the head of a basic block. So the basic block is the obvious spacing separation here. It's the tail. The block 18 here really has a control projection 18. I didn't print it, but it's there. That represents the head of that block. And this guy's 19 is the head of that block. There's no tail on either of those blocks. And then here there's a region, which is actual region 23, which I didn't print as a, the word region, but it's region 23 here as the head of this block, if you like. And then the return is the tail of the block. This one has a tail op that's explicit. So not everyone gets an explicit tail op. Everyone gets an explicit head. Ifs not the head. So here I say, oh, you're not the head. So I'm going to move you to get the head done. If you're a fee node, you're always pinned also to your region at the start of the basic block. So that one's done. So I just wanted to add for the benefit of others that, you know, what I think you've mentioned implicitly is that certain things like control flow and fee, they don't move, right? They get yeah. pinned. Yeah. They get so pinned. by pinning means that we cannot move them around. Yeah. So they, their basic block was chosen. Their slot zero has already filled in. And is pinned will cover fees and control flow and some other things. So ask the question, been there, done that on start? And the answer is no. It's a control flow graph. He's going to get pinned in. His late is going to be fixed. The start node happens to have node ID 2. If I go to my late array, node ID 2, he's going to be filled in. And he's himself as his own early schedule. Always with CFGs, it's yourself as your own schedule. You're not a region. Now you get to the excitement. I'm going to walk your outputs. And this is, means I'm doing a, a top-down walk from start to stop walking outputs. It's post-order. I walk first, and then I do work. And in particular, to do anti-depths, I want to walk the memory edges before I walk the loads. So I have two walking steps, and I could clean this up a little bit to make them have the same conditions, but they both walk steps, say, basically, walk forwards, don't walk around loops. You don't need to. They'll get covered when they get covered on a forward walk. And then the first one says, oh, and if you're memory, uh, uh, do you, and if you're not memory, don't. And then the second loop says, okay, now do everybody, including the memories of everybody. So the first one is memory only. And that's where I'm going to schedule just the memory edges before I schedule everyone else. That's because I want my stores scheduled before I try to put anti-dependencies on the loads. So that's why I have double walk loops. Again, like I said, they, they could and should be cleaned up. So the first one is more obviously just the memory, and the second one is everybody. So there's a few things I look at here. Um, I do have cases where... Uh, I have some guys who are pinned. This isn't one of them who don't who have a null use. So this is Debian do is another thing I had to do. This, this test is strictly here again for the array list thing. I had to put in some uh, exit tests that included for infinite loops that included a constant. If you've never used a constant zero, then in the middle of the iteration, I added an output edge to the constant, the start node of a constant zero, and it blew concurrent modification exception on array list for the iterator. So a whole lot of lines got some stupid code to cover concurrent modification. This is one of, there are like two other places that I had to do that. Fine. Then there's a bin there, done that. I do that before I go down in um, because I didn't want to ask the question about is back edge. Um, or is type mem if you were already walked, but we could argue that I could tittle the loop iterations to get rid of this test because that test is repeated at the start right away. So I probably could get rid of that test. Back edge is the obvious thing. I'll look at it briefly. If you're a loop or you're a fee from a loop, then you're back and you're coming off of the back edge side of things. And if you're not, then you're not. And now, am, am I, um, is my use memory? No, my use is some constant. So I, I'm ignoring you. Let me go find another use here. This use on the left here, dead controls, the permanent, one of those permanent nodes I had to add, which has a, a, a which had a weird uh, output use. It's not a memory. Try again. 
uh, control projection, not a non memory, try again. This one is projection for R, the, the start of the world, not a, not a memory, try again, which is all pretty boring here. Here's a projection for dollar two. That's a memory. That's alias number two. <clears throat> Go be recursive and do the same thing. Lather, rinse, repeat a while. I'm not going to repeat this. You're going to get down to where you're actually going to do something. So I'm going to set my breakpoint down here and run on. And we're starting at the top and we're, we're looking for memory outs until we get down to something. Okay, I got down to a store. That meant I, I found everyone who wasn't already otherwise pinned and all my outputs have been scheduled. And what is the outputs of a store that they got scheduled? Well, his output is size one, it's a fee. The fees got scheduled, fees were pinned. So I have a store there. This is store number 22. So let's go look at the picture here. It's actually the store of excitement. This guy, his output, his only output is 24, oops, right there. That is this fee. So he has a use along the edge, 14, I'm sorry, 22, pointing to this store here, along that edge of the control flow graph. And because it's a fee use, it's gonna be not ahead of the fee directly, but ahead of the block the fee refers to, which will be ordered outputs, left-hand block, block 18. He's gotta use some block 18. <clears throat> via the fee. Okay, let's go look at your outputs. You're dialing one, when we get your use block, what does use block do? It does the fee check I just said. If you're not a fee, you got your use from the late. If you are a fee, go find out which one you are. Well, you're, you're gonna find your input here. Oh, I found it. <clears throat> it's the true block, block 18. So I have a use along block 18. Make sure I got a block head. I haven't found any other uses yet, so I'm just gonna record the first one in block 18. That's my LCA, least common ancestor of your uses. And I have no other uses, so it's done. I have a least common ancestor. Now I'm gonna grab an early. So let's go look at this. My least common ancestor of my uses is the true block and my early is the control block. Let's go back. My least common ancestor of uses is block 18. And the earliest is control. I have a range for the store. He could be here and he could be here. I get one of two choices for him. And I have to drink because I'm running out of voice. Okay. What did you do? Oh, I see. I'm trying to use Emacs keystrokes on Google. Fine. Uh, his currently early is set at actually up here, and I'm going to compute a late for him. All right. So I've got an early. I got a late. He's not a load, which has an anti dependency, so I don't have to care about loads. I'm now going to search for a best range. I'm going to start at the low. I'm going to walk up to the early. I'm going to find somebody who is better or not. There's a cutout again. Debian deal is another piece just for that stupid hack to get around CME. So I took my first cut best as his original lowest common ancestor. Now I'm going to go up a step and then repeat. Are you better? Are you better? Are you better? Until uh, I fall off the top and I hit the earliest point. And then I'm done and I'll pick the best spot within this linear range. Okay, what does better do? Better says you're in a least loop depth and in a greatest immediate dominator depth. And there's a one step tiebreaker on an if we have to, because he's a block tail, you have to go up to a block head. So ask the question, are you in the same depth? And if I look at the debugger on the left, everyone's at depth one, there's no loop here. So you're depth one. So it's the, Deepest in the immediate dominator depth, which says you are better, or you would be better if I, oh no, the least is, is the lowest has already been done. And that it's not, the, the control block is not better. So I'm now asking the question about, uh, da, 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 where did LCA, the, the control block is where I'm at already. And then I'm done. I didn't hit an if. So I'm going to say, I record you got a note at all. And this is, the the and then the late binding here. So I put a hack in to be do. This is part of the same hack for the array list CME. 
but it basically just means I have a, I have a late range. It's between best. It was between best and our least common ancestor early, and I pick best. And best is happens to be equal to least common ancestor, which is this true block. So I'm going to move this store from here down to there, which matches the original program. And that's it for the store. And it's it for most common computations. Why do you really need uh, early and late and compute the best thing between them? Well, look so... at what better does. Hmm. What is better doing? He says better is least loop depth. Mm -hmm. I'm doing loop invariant code motion here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a range that may be in a loop as written by the user, but is only used after the loop or only used before the loop. And then the 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 depth check here is saying it's better to be out of the loop. Mm -hmm. So in C2, I have real block frequencies and I use a block frequency as a better test instead of loop depth. But if I don't have real block frequencies and I have loop depths instead, I'll use them as a proxy. So whatever you want to do for what it means to be better, but least frequency. Okay. Are, are you pr producing any sort of guesses on loop iteration counts or are you just saying loop depth, loop tree depth? And that's, In that's C2, good. we go first to, uh, we go first to exact counted loop numbers. Then we go to profile data. Then we go to loop depth. So there's a there's a series of steps, and we do a standard network flow analysis of profile frequencies to normalize the numbers because the profile data is racy and it's crappy and it's all over the map. So you have to do some cleanup on it. Um, so before I walk into Code Motion, I have a reasonable execution frequency listed for every basic block. Okay, okay, so you basically boil that data down into a estimate, which is your execution frequency number. Yeah, yeah, it's a double precision. <clears throat> and, and I, and yeah. you know, I, you know I, I, if I don't have other data available, I do things like loops are deeper by ten. Average execution count is ten. And Just do you say that every time you go through an if, if you don't have data, that it divides the 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 uh, like basically cuts the execution count in half for each branch or do you have okay. some? Yeah, no, there's some smarts there. Mm -hmm. So uh, in C2, I have this notion of, I believe you to be a safety check. And if you're a safety check, you, you essentially never mm -hmm. fail. Okay, so you might fail. So I give you this one in a million chance. If you're a null check, I count you as one in 10 that you're, not null, you're occasionally null. And you could argue that some of these things are always null and occasionally not null and it's the other way around. And eh, fine, I don't have any profile data. If I did, I wouldn't be asking the question. If you had profile data, I don't ask that question. Okay. And then if you're neither of the two, yeah, then it goes 50-50. Yeah, when, when I first tried to make these types of numbers, I ended up with, uh in in tests in programs where there were lots of conditionals and not many loops i ended up with very low frequent low yeah. numbers on the yeah you, you keep dividing in half you divide it a few times in half you you divide off the bottom you get 50 or, or 57 or 60 whatever divides in a row on a double precision number it went to zero and underflowed yeah so there is checks for underflowing yeah okay and it, what can you do about that? You just have to sort of. Oh yeah, yeah. You you you, you kind of want to have a, a a frequency that just it's all relative. I want to be more right. or less than somebody else. So I don't really care about exact numbers. I get them when they're available, and when they're not, I just need a relative frequency. So if mm -hmm. I'm splitting too many times and I'm down into the if 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 sixty seven times in a row, um, I quit dividing by two. And on either side, I, I let the numbers go wonky in that sense, but I'll prevent them from underflowing as long as there is a, a, a way to slice in between everybody. So you could imagine using big rational, other than the expense of, of running big rational, but you could run big rational there. 
Yeah, I was actually going to ask about about using something like that instead. Yeah, if you don't have an execute uh, a compile time budget, you could use Big Rational. Also, yeah. mostly your programs are tiny, and you're not going to get sixty seven ifs in a row, so you're just not going to fall off this problem. You yeah, can don't assert it and make sure you don't, but you're yeah. unlikely to kill yourself on the size of programs you're looking at. I have some crappy yeah. shit in here as a test case from the fuzzer. Oops, wrong button here. Let's try this one. Here, this guy. And, and, and you know, maybe the fuzzer hands me a, a 57 D if test, right? It's just like runs on and on and on and on. That's not really, it's probably no more than 10 deep, probably more than five deep. There's a lot of junk in there though. Wow. A lot of junk. Fine. I guess all those while loops are going to keep the numbers nice and high. You might go the other direction off the top. Yeah, and you can go the other direction too. Yes. You can say times 10 for each of your while loops. After you nest 57, you blew out the top end. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, I got to cut both ways. You got to have cutouts for both ways. Yeah. All right. Somewhere between early and late, I found my best using whatever heuristic I'm using. I don't care. It's a heuristic. By the way, when you're writing code like this and you have an algorithm and you have a heuristic, break them apart. Here is algorithm. If for earlier DOM walk DOM tree, here's heuristic better. And there's nothing out, you know, mathematically perfect or whatever about these two. So I'm going to put it off to the side. And then I can change the heuristic later without changing the core guts of the algorithm. That's just a general philosophy on these things. All right, I'm done with my store. It's placed. And he comes and says, I'm, I'm done with you. And I go on to whatever's next in line. OK, so um, there's not too many other things in here that are going to get placed except the load. Let's see if we hit it. Uh, the load is, in fact, the next thing to get placed. Everyone else is pinned in this program. So it's just the load here. And now I have to show only one case of how the load does anti depths And there are a couple. Um, I'm going to run out of time to show all the things. So I'm hoping people get the high level picture of how anti-dependencies work here. So actually, before I head into this, are people good with what I did with how I found the, the, the late schedule so far? No one... No one says yeah. anything. Okay, so let's go look at the late schedule for the load. And the load says, all right, in his load, he has some uses. Go find the earliest or the late, the, the lowest common ancestor, the earliest of the late uses. Here's a use. It's the return. It's the only use. Go find the use block of return. I'll skip that. That's going to be the region that I merged at. So I'll go look here real quick. At the, well, maybe look at the Google Docs here. So I have one use of the return. That's this block, block 23 with this region. That's where the use of the load is. OK. Set it. Go to my other uses. I have none. That's it. I have an early. I did already. Prior pass. I have a range. Dollar control to the, to the least common ancestor region. I have a range from in the program from the uh, uh, region at the bottom to the control at the top. I can only walk along the immediate dominator steps. So I have to pick one of these two locations. Let me show you. There's only two locations. Let's go to this. Okay. Here is my late. I could put the load down here. So let's go move the load. You can see, get a feel for it here. Imagine I could put the load down here. Now the store here on this conditional side would, would crush the memory I'm loading. So this is incorrect. But the output of the load the return, he's ahead of his outputs. So he's he's good in that sense. He's just got this other problem. His other spot would be the immediate dominator of the region, which would be this block, block six here. Them serves two choices. Okay, so I'm looking at a load. So I'm going to go do something weird here. I'm going to try and figure out where, which stores and which fees are changing the state of memory such that I need to load before they happen. Because if I load after they happen, it's too late, I'm crushed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk my list of choices for the load and flag the blocks as things where the load might go. Then I'm going to walk the memory uses that might crush it and see if they hit one of these blocks. And if they do, I have to be above it. So here's the walk. From LCA, where I set this anti-dependence number just equal to the load's node ID, it's my tag saying, 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this uh, load. Is it going to be anti-dependent on somebody? And I'll reuse that anti-field for other loads at other passes. Basically, the anti-field is once per node, but its lifetime is limited to this loop nest. And it is... Right. So it's an optimization because all you're trying to do is uh, record the path up yeah, the tree, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I have... But I have you're kind created... of using this anti-field as a, as a cache of the path. Yes. Yes. And I could, for instance, allocate storage for that path, except that would kill performance in the long run for lots of things. If I do that, a lot of places you'll just drown in allocations. So I have made a, a free field in the, the node in order to record. Uh, I pre-allocated it there. Okay. And then, oops, da, 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 da. here I am lazily computing the immediate dominator for the region which I put a breakpoint in, I forgot. So steps up, he's going to say it's the if. So coming out of there and I'm in this, so I'm walking the dominator set. So when I come to the next point here, it's this if node gets set. And then uh, I hit the dollar control block as well, and then I'm done. Okay, so that was the tag. So I've tagged the, the region and his nid field is set to the loads ID 23. And his immediate dominator is going to be the if, which I'm going to find by going up. If I look here, the anti-field was not set on one of the side paths. But I go up again, I get to an if, and it's set anti is set right there. And if I go up again, na, 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 scrolling over because I got tiny windows because I have a big font. Again, it's set there. Fine. Okay, so I, I did the walk and set these guys. So now I'm going to go to the loads memories output, okay, and walk them. And, and I think this is a good time for that graph picture. Here's the load. His memory input is this store. This store has outputs, which consist of the load and the blue edge back out, another store, and a feed. One or more of these is going to crush the memory that this load wants to load. And so this load has to be ahead of one of the or one or more of these guys. Okay. And that's the general rule of how you antidependence go. I have a load. He has an input memory. That input memory got crushed. He needs to load before it gets crushed. Who crushes it? It's one of the outputs. None too many of outputs. Somebody crushes. Well, eventually somebody crushes it. Uh, it might be the return at the end of the world, but somebody crushes it. He needs to be ahead of those. Okay. So looking at your outputs, which one comes first? It's this store node, store of F is one. This is like the one I care about. So I go in my store. I'm going to go grab some things and go down to the anti-dep call. Okay. Coming into the anti-dep call, I come in with the load. The block of the store, that's this block 18. It's off to the side block. And I have the loads uh, uh, defining block for the memory, which is the control project. It's the first block in the program. I'm going to walk from the store to, the, uh, uh, to where the store gets his memory. It's the same as the loads memory. That's the reason we're here. And if I find you a hit, we're going to do something about it. So I'm going to start by looking at the storage block. It's at 18. It's not on the loads path. He doesn't care. He says no. But the store went up some more because he came from some earlier location. It's from this control block from this if here. That is touched. I'm going to stop and say, wait a second. I need to do something here. So I'm going to re record the old LCA because I'm going to compute a new one. I'm going to lift the load ahead of the store. And, oh, look, I'm doing a region nodes, immediate dominator depth calculation. I left the breakpoint in. Um, well, it'll get cached after this one step. There's the max twice, and it's at depth four. Fine, whatever. That's used for the immediate dominators, which are used here. And now I have moved up to the if. And I say, um, I'm going to lift you, Mr. Load, who otherwise could have been in the region, I'm going to lift you to your media dominator to the if. And I'm going to put an edge in the graph as well. 
and I'm going to walk one more step and I don't need to, it's done. I get out and I've added an edge and I've lifted the load to the diff. I look this, at- uh, This anti-diff that yeah. uh, you added just now, yes. uh, just for clarity, it's, it's not a real dependency. It's an artificial one just to yeah. make sure yeah. we constrain the execution order. I added an edge there to constrain the execution order. And if you look at this program, it's actually not necessary. Oh, this one is it. No, I have a program nearby. Well, okay, let me we'll talk about it when we get there. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had an edge that's there strictly for ordering. So all my other edges have been semantically correctness in a free-flowing graph. Now I need an edge to get correctness in a bound-up graph, in a fixed control flow graph. Um, and then I'm going to keep looking. I have another use. It's a load. Um, it's himself. So I don't need to do anything. So I'll get out. I have another use. That's a fee. Well, what does fee do? Fee says, I bring a crushing use on each of the inputs that match <clears throat> the, the memory in question, the, the defining memory. It's not every input to the fee. It's just along the ones that get defined. But the fee crushes because he merges with other memory. And I don't know after the fee. I don't know what that state is. So I have to load before the fee along that path. So I do a path thing on fees. For all your inputs, is this input match? No, that's the false side. Your input you may match. True, yes, OK. The block counts as the region, the fees region's input edge. That's the fee.region.cfg. So fee.region.cfg. So the store block, if you will, is along this path here, node 19. Come back over here. This fee here is saying along node 19 path. Oh, let me do it from the Google Docs again, sorry. <clears throat> this fee down here, yes, has an input of the original store up here. And I'm still trying to sort out where I'm going to put this load. I don't know where the hell this load's going to go yet. Where is he going to go? I don't know. So that input path is block 19. This path crushes at the end of the path. Alias number two crushed after here because I'm merging it with the store and I don't know, I can't do it after here. So it has to be ahead of here. So in theory, in theory, I could put the load here. If he, uh, uh, if he post dominated, if he, if he dominated his uses, but he doesn't dominate his uses there, he has to go higher. So this would only be a partial load. I have to load on the other path. So he has to be higher than that. Okay, so back to where I'm at. Walk in the fee. The fee says, hey, I have a, a, a store block. I'm not done. I'm looking, do I have a hit on the anti-dependence for 19? The answer is no. So nothing. I go up again. Look again here. And this other next higher path, it's the if. It's the same one I just got from the store. I claim, yes, you have an issue. Oh, I do your media dominator check and discover that I didn't move you. So I don't need another edge. And then I'm done. I'm out. So he tried to put add an edge. You already had an edge. He didn't need one. So he quit. This means that this the, the load here doesn't need another edge. But this crushing along that path has been taken care of as well. So coming out here, break, look, stop. Ah, done. What is my LCA? It's this if. And what is the early? It's the control proj. I have to go in between the bottom of the first block and the top of the first block. It's the same block, really. I just have the if as a block in instead of a block tail, so a block head. So I'm going to fix that. Go grab here, ask the better question. And there's a cutout for ifs. I would go ahead and say you're better. You're, you're going to move up one more to the first block. Then I'm out of... Uh, out of walk, out of choices, I'm done, and it's here in the first block. So going back to my little guy here, I'm getting rid of my little comments. This load, oops, 
where did he go? Oh, I hate you as an editor. Thank you. He he has to be up here, which is how the original program was written. So nothing really happened here, but he he is loaded ahead of the crushing store, and there is a dependence from the store to the load that forces the situation. So I set him and I'm done. And anyone else in the world have another store to go do that's the unrelated store of a zero, um, which probably doesn't matter because he's stuck in the first block no matter what you do. And there's the other store of the two. And then I got some constants I'm gonna schedule. Why are you not pinned? Oh, cause you're the, uh, he should be pinned, fine. Here's some news. A bunch of things are getting done now, which I'm not walking because they all have no choices about where they go. And they're going to constants and I hit the stop and I'm done and I'm out. And that's the scheduled version of things. Um, so let me copy that. Dump. Okay, so here is the scheduled program. Uh, there is a, a missing jump here and a missing jump here because I haven't done basic block layouts. Oops. Jumps here. Uh, can you paste it in the docs too? Uh, yeah. Let me do this. And this will be the late schedule. Okay. So what happens here? Okay. So one of the things going on is that there's no local block scheduling. So the pretty printer doesn't pretty print within a block. So I'm going to put the if down to make it a little more obvious what happened there. Um, but here is store of a one. The, the one the only use of the constant one was the store. He got pushed down to the store. And the load got forced up. And you can see the anti-dependence I highlighted. If I can highlight it, add it on the store to the load. And that's the anti-dependence fixing the problem for the load there. So we say ended dependencies force an order. Oh, they cute. force ordering, yeah. Hmm. And that is so that I don't have an input, a memory edge alive twice. So let me show you, let me show you a graph thing that looks uh, graph wise here. So at this load, I can't move it around, damn it. The, the dot F is using a blue memory edge. And the second dot after the right crushes it and makes a blue memory edge. That's the southern, the, the down one. How, how, to... how, how will you find what crushes what? So well, that's this is what that code just was. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I, when I'm showing here, what I'm trying to show here is if I were to drag the load down toward the return, mm -hmm. his long blue edge number one would overlap with several other unrelated edge number ones, memory edges. And that would require having memory alive twice. Now, if memory fit in a register, you just put in a register and you wouldn't care. But of course, memory doesn't fit in a register. It's too big and you can't have it alive twice. And so instead of having to lock twice, you have to force an ordering such that it's only ever alive once. Mm -hmm. Okay. Forcing an ordering saves you another load. It saves me from copying the entire state of memory to get the one mm -hmm. load correct. Okay. I have to load early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. In, in the land of... Uh, uh, strong memory models and concurrency, you can never load a twice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. unless the user asks for a load twice. You cannot take a load and split it and load it twice because you would get different answers because memory changes under you. Okay. Oops, the wrong, wrong guy. Oh, I see it hit it. No, 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 no. Let's go back over here. Yes, there you go. Yeah, so in the late schedule, this load got pushed up so that the memory state that flows out of the if and across this block to the store isn't competing with a memory that's flowing out of this store and merging down to this fee here. Because this store's memory down to the fee where he merges is a block of memory that's been changed. And I cannot have the load pass over that blue region, highlighted region, um, because the memory's it's the wrong memory. Mm -hmm. It would be crushed. So, done. Cool.
That was very good, Cliff. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So one question that I still have is, you mentioned that there's a case where the simple uh, anti-dependency approach, which I was using before, doesn't work. Yeah. Um, it looked like the one that we just walked through would work with the simple yeah. approach. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go look at anti deps two here. Okay. I'm not certain if this is the one that fails, but there there are some fails here, floating around in in this chapter eleven test. One or more of these would fail the simple algorithm. Yeah, this is the one. This is the one? Okay. Uh, okay, so... It would incorrectly add the antidependence. Incorrectly add the antidependence. Okay, yeah. Um, let me grab this and add it here. And I have caught you... And would, the head of the would it make schedule. sense before we walk through all the code to just look at the uh, look at this source program yeah. and say, okay, okay, here's where the conflict happens. Okay, so here I have the the source program in the Google yeah. Doc. Okay, so the the load here of v.f is confused because this test picks between one of two pointers, either the v pointer or the t pointer. So this loads input. From its pointer is pinned by a fee that's merging v and t here. Okay. That means this load can't happen above his input of the fee here. It cannot yeah. go above it. His memory input, though, is from the last store, which is the initializing writes that happened up here when I said new s t dot f got set to zero. It's initializing write. Here's another store. He is also conditional down. And if I look at his input, the, the loads memory input, I'll find this store, the initializing zero store. If I look at the initializing zero store's outputs, one of them will be this store, and one of them will be this load. And there'll be a, a, a memory merge output uh, because I, I have a store here and I have not the store, so I have a merge memory just like I did in the other case. Okay, so here in the in the early schedule of things, I have a bunch of stores. Let me order them a little smarter so that they we can see the last initializing right here. Okay, ten to twelve, twelve to yeah. Okay, so so this is and then the, the damn cut and paste didn't didn't work. Between the two, fine. So I have a bunch of stores here. There's two initializing stores. This store here, number 30, that's the store with a value two that needs to sync. It hasn't sunk yet in the early go of things. When I start doing anti dependencies, it will have sunk. And it will sync down to the fee. His one use is just 33, which is a fee at the bottom uh, along the right hand side, which goes up to block 16. It, it, it lands down here. Um, and you can say this is like jump to 31. And in fact, I'm going to move it around a little bit here, maybe a little clearer here. And this is also a jump to 31. And the and the two empty blocks in the middle, part of the diamond, where I'm going left or right, and I'm picking V or T. So I'm going to, uh, I can't indent this, damn it. Google won't let me do it. Nope. Okay. Yeah, as a code editor, it goes, it sucks. I'm trying to do a little bit of indent here without taking forever. There's a little, there's a little control flow graph diamond here. And that didn't indent enough, so it probably didn't help. I'm going I'm to take it back. Fine. Okay. So in the middle of the immediate dominated, the, the late scheduling, when I'm coming around and looking at this load here, He's going to go up to his memory input, which is 12, which is this zero store of t dot field is stored to zero. He's going to look at his outputs, these outputs right here. One's the load, one's the store in question, one's the feed. Okay. When he looks at the store in question down here, he's going to say, this store demands an anti-dependent edge 
on the load and the load will say, oh, I need, I'm sorry, the store will say, oh, I need an antidependence on this load 26 to force it up. So I've added this, I will, the simple algorithm will simply say, walk the outputs of block 12. If I find a memory right, put an antidependence between it and the load. Now I have the problem that the load, his outputs, which now include this new output, 30, his outputs, least common ancestor, is up to block six. But his inputs, lowest point, is block 24. And he has a, an empty valid region. He cannot be scheduled. I've lost your face. Oh, yeah, sorry. That was Google. me. No, it's... All I was doing was grunting. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, right. No, I was waiting to see if I needed to say more or shut up. Uh, no, okay. So that that makes... Uh, that makes sense, yeah. Um, oh, and somebody hit chat, and I don't know. Got to run camera now. I see why. So when I do my silly thing where I tag the loads path, that load tagging path stops at block 24 and doesn't go any higher. And so the path all the way up to block six never gets tagged. When I walk the store's immediate dominator inputs, he jumps from block six from block 16 to block six, never sees a tag. So he never adds the anti-dependence edge. Yeah. And it, it wouldn't be a, probably be a pretty flaky approach to say, oh, if, if I end up with no valid live ranges, I should just start stripping anti-dependencies off until it works. Yeah, exactly. You, you'll just, you'll just do a different bug. I mean, the, 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 this particular flavor has been in C2 for 25 years. Now, and I think with a little bit more refinement, it's like a little bit smarter than this because there are a few places where I'll add an anti-dep with the current one that C2 will manage to skip, but it's not, it, it no longer is incorrect. There was the earlier simple version and I ran with it for six months or more until I hit a, you know, you're just, this is just not going to work. And I screwed around and I did a couple of different variations and I kept finding breakages and I finally sat down and said, okay, let's do some algebra, let's do some math here. Uh -huh. the, uh, the the thing I didn't want to do is do post-dominance, which is another full pass of a real algorithm. But the, the optimal case requires post-domination. Um, so I did the second most optimal thing here, which is this path hack, where I walk a path and I tag it, and then I walk the other path. And if they overlap, I throw an edge in. And that may force a load above where it's conditionally used only but it will never make it illegal and it will never let it get below a crushing store. So occasionally I load things too high with this particular algorithm. Okay, and is that something that you just accept even in C2? Um, yes, the, 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 because I didn't want to do post-dominance in C2. Um, and I do uh, easy cutouts for stupid cases. So actually making that happen is actually really difficult. You can, but the count of times it happens is, you know, countable on one finger and giant code base of things. And then it's an x86. So you did an extra load on a path you never took. Eh, whatever. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Other questions? Not for me. I don't completely understand the path thing, but at least I know what I'm looking for to sort of walk through the code on my own maybe yeah conceptually it seems like you know you you look at the you trace the path of the load and you trace the paths of the stores and if they cross each other <laughs> then you gotta have the anti-dependency if yeah. they don't cross because <laughs> one of them is in say in an if block then you don't put the anti-dependency yeah that's basically it. Yeah. So in general, you are ordering in order to avoid these things. So yeah. Well, I mean, we're discovering there exists an order that prevents mm -hmm. 
that removes the need for an anti-dependence. In this mm -hmm. case, there yeah. exists an order. And that, um, uh, I forgot how, how we said it, the lifting. So, so for example, in the if text, if uh, this arg uh, plus one, where where v equals t, you, you have to, you have to, you'd have to know that the that this is a dependency it has to not dependency it is it has to uh know that is there so it cannot be uh, mistaken I'm, I'm missing something so I, I, yeah. you, you you say it again i i try to to pick the the right kind of uh, words but uh, uh maybe, so maybe one way to think about it is you know it's an optimization problem right so you're trying to put everything in the best place yeah okay that's what this is doing right mm -hmm. this is saying okay all my nodes could go here and could go there but what's the best place and the best mm -hmm. place is has to be also semantically correct yeah Decide. Sorry. Our arg is dead there. I'm trying to, to I was gonna pull up a loop that had something in oh well the 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 find finder. Of course I, I carefully hand wrote it so there's no loop invariant code to motion. So here's a prime finder on the right here. It's counting primes up to arg. It's valid simple code. I tested a bunch of times. I do something for evens. The main loop says, uh, you know, while the squared value is less than prime, you only go up to the square root. If your integer math comes up even, you're 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 not a prime. And you skip by two. And then when you finally break out, if you never set the tag, you're a prime. And I bump your prime count, and then I go find the next odd number for the next prime. Okay, it's a prime counter. Yeah. Well, the main thing here is that there's a lot of math going on. And in this case, there's nothing that's loop invariant. But the general goal is, yeah, I could have loop invariant crap in here just by accident, just by however I wrote the code. And then I'd want it optimizer to move it out of the loop. And there's a doubly nested loop. So there's an outer loop. So if it was loop invariant even further, I'd want to go all the way up the outer loop too. And that's the main reason we're doing the scheduling. So there's, a, there's an easy fix. And that would be to pin everybody. Nobody moves. And there's no scheduling issue. But then you don't get any optimization either. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I think most, I, I as a programmer, I assume that the compiler does this optimization. So I don't try to move yeah. the yeah. invariant stuff out because I just assume that that will be done for me. You know? And a lot of the code that's loop invariant isn't obviously available, is, isn't plainly available to you as loop invariant. And that's because there's a ray math going on. And there's like null pointer checks for, for things that are only first touched in loops. And in, in these kind of cases, you know, no, no one, you don't, you don't see the, the temporary expansions that are going on. Here, I wrote a loop that said for I, and I couldn't use an iterator because I have two arrays, so I needed a parallel loop. Here's a load. Late dot length, that's a load. That's a loop invariant load. Looks like it's written in the loop. If I naively expand this loop in simple, that load will start life in the loop. But I want it hoisted out of the loop. It's loop invariant. So you just write code with arrays, you get loop invariant code all the time. Here I have a, 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 an obvious null check on late, except I have a pre or null, pre null check, but this would be in the loop. And the pre-null check would hopefully clean it out. So that's maybe not a great test case. Um, and then there's a range check, which is going to be stuck in the loop anyhow until you do range check motion on it. Other things in here, I didn't do a good job. I did too good a job of writing them because I write that way naturally. But yeah, you don't normally haul loop invariants out when you write code. Sometimes it's just, it's not reasonable to even think about it that way. So... You, you just write your code and then, the, yeah, optimizer takes it out of the loop. Oh, yeah, here we go. For node in outputs. Okay, what does in outputs really do? Well, this goes to Java's iterator syntax. And he says, I'm going to call the iterator constructor. I'm going to make a new allocation of an iterator object. And then I'm going to set it to zero. And I'm going to start counting up to the limit of my array lists 
output length. There's an object. I do load the object iterator value. That becomes an array load of the in or in dot outputs array, which then becomes the use value. And then I take the array index and I add one to it and I store it back down into the iterator object. So inside this loop, there's an iterator object which says, hey, stop that, says load iterator, add one to the index, store the index and load the iterator index and then load it as off the array base to go get a, 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 the use field and carry on. But that load increment store, that's cleaned out by C of nodes and becomes loop invariant code motion of an index. And, and so the load and the store disappear as a, a initial value of zero and a final write of the iterators, final value after the store, after the loop. And in the body of the loop, it's just plus one on a register. Hmm. That's the standard poster child people cleans out iterator tests I, I presented on this show before. But you get a lot of these things. They just show up because and then you write your code how you write your code and suddenly you get loops uh, in whatever loop invariants inside your loops but this tile is um geared towards uh imperative uh imperative style of code so would it make it so would uh, some concepts exist that would aid more functional uh style of writing code or it doesn't matter if if you want if you can boil one into the other Let's say, for example, if you map over some list to yeah. to be exactly boiled out to, to an iterator. Well, all, all the, you know, Haskell and ML and OCaml, all these guys generate this kind of code in the end. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. do some steps up front to try and clean out the functional calls so they don't have mystery calls in the middle of your loops. So one of the key things that I'll say for, for people in general is if you have a function call in a body of a loop, you know, there's your problem. For performance reasons, if there's a function call in the body of the loop, you got an issue. Hmm. Here I have a loop. He's got a, a, a test for exiting. He's got a range check, which I know is eliminated elsewhere. He's got an array load of some math. Let's add, subtract, multiply, divide. Oh, look, here's a function call. If this does not inline, that's where hmm. my performance goes. It's calling some stupid call a billion times over. Set def hmm. is tiny. So it inlines. And because it inlines, I don't have a function call in the loop. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, setdef has a bunch of range array loads that get range check eliminated as well. And there's a bunch of null checks getting eliminated as well. And it all cleans out. If you have a, an arbitrary map or an arbitrary function, the, the compiler has trouble inlining, getting rid of the function call in the loop. Right? So that's what these guys do mm -hmm. as a first step. D, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, you functionalize that unknown function. And they yeah. say, oh, you're actually doing a summer reducer, blah, blah, blah. And here's the actual code. Then they can inline it. Now you can got a, an array over an inline, whatever. There's no, no more function calls in the loop. Life goes fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. So... And, and actually, to the extent that they cannot inline, you suck <laughs> for performance. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Yeah. Pick your pick your battles. Sometimes you just want to get it done. So you want these high level languages to get it done. Sometimes it needs to go fast. And then you know. You can't peek through, the compiler can't peek through function call. All your loop optimizations went to hell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It's going to be quite hard to write up this chapter and explain. So we can have a discussion about some of these things here. One of them is... I expect compiler writers to have a strong understanding of graph theory. They don't have to be experts or making new algorithms, but they should know what a graph theory is. I think you missed some fundamental, I don't know if you had compiler courses in college, but they're always taught in compiler courses in college. Um, so I think you can assume a base knowledge of some amount of graph theory. Um, and, and you know, some references, some, some stuff that's all over the interwebs is fine, but I think it's safe to say, I'm going to assume you know how to do a walk over an arbitrary graph, right? Now, immediate dominators and dominators definitely have links to the things on that one. Um, that's more specialized here, but it's still fairly generic. And it is all over every compiler. So I think if you're going to be a compiler writer, you should figure out immediate dominators and dominator trees. 
Now, an incremental nominator tree, uh, okay, a little clever, fine. I did it cheap, easy hack for incremental dominators, and I do it because I use them while the graph is being constantly shaped. And the asymptotic cost of the incremental algorithm is not super low in the worst case scenario, but in practice, people don't write these things. And in practice, the graph stabilizes after a bit. The control flow graph stabilizes after a bit. So the fact that it changes a little bit is okay. So I do a little redundant work on that one. Um, I could get rid of the redundant work here because the graph, the control flow graph is no longer changing. The hack I do with setting a tag, that's, I've seen that before. I don't know where you, oh, that one's not, that one came out of other things I've done. Like a lot of the early, well, okay. During my PhD classes on graph algorithms, studying why these things work, I swear I saw that technique used by these guys writing you know, Fortran code, basically doing graph walks from 70s. Um, so it's not super new. I was going to say, oh, did, yeah, did you knew we could, however, come pay a visit to where I went to that I had to add a separate graph, separate array for late. This use is null thing that that comes about because of stupid things with array list. However, the double walk once for memory and once not <clears throat> comes about because I need anti-dependence edges. So cleaning this up so the double walk doesn't look so ugly is not hard to do. You look at the C2 version, it's actually faster and a lot trickier. So I've loaded it kind of easy to read, but we can clean it up some, but you still need to do the, those, the late stores that are gonna crush a load have to be scheduled before you can figure out where to put the load. And the stores always have to sync. So they, they don't typically <laughs> go anywhere. They, they don't have to sync, they mostly sync. Fine. Everything else I think is kind of straightforward. This one is, that's the junk left over. The use block has this one weird dibble for fee or not the fee. This loop could be changed slightly and it really is for all outputs. Grab your use block, take the immediate dominator of collection of uses. So if I made IDOM take a null input, I would just get rid of the if and just say LCA is IDOM with LCA. In fact, that's not a bad hack to simplify this loop. That's the core, core of the algorithm. anti depths here, big discussion because they get ugly. I kind of cleaned it up once, maybe another round, make it a little tighter. The search, this is from the concurrent, you know, CME concurrent modification from array list hack. If that went away, you'd have this one, which is basically walk the IDOM chain again, find the better, max over, max over this list, done. So I think it's not too complicated and a little cleanup would make it simpler looking and then easier to talk about too. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that, you know, because a um, lot of the stuff you, uh, you've you implemented like like loops, uh, loop, whatever, loop depth stuff we didn't go through and then the dominator stuff. I mean, I can't. We can't just point to standard literature because you've done it in a different way, right? So we have to explain each of these things. Um, you know, and even even the basic block stuff is not there, so we can't really. We have to because you're doing it differently, so we have no, to like explain no, everything. No, 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 that that's a red herring. That that's a, that's a that's a you you you've got your head screwed in the in the round such that I have to have the word basic block. But a basic block is, is a member of a control flow graph, and the control flow graph and basic block are available readily via accessors. Now, I could change the accessor names so they said BB in them, and maybe you'd be happier with them, but that's just literally a fucking name change. Oh, I'm storing it in slot zero. Yeah, but hide it in your basic block. You're hiding where you're storing it. Well, I'm going to hide it where I'm going to store it. Don't look at slot zero. Look at the basic block accessor. Okay, it happens to be just a thin wrapper over slot zero. No, it's it's, it's not exactly. I I get your point, but it's not not exactly what people are familiar with, right? So, for example, here, um, the, the if is the termination of the basic block, but that's not um, 
that's not clear unless you explain it, right? So that that is every basic block ever. The ifs are only at the end of a basic block. Yes, what I mean is that when you look at the graph and you look at the control flow nodes, they don't tell you what the basic blocks are. Uh, uh, you have to kind of Wait. So one one thing we could they do, do, and I've been no, no, thinking no. They, about it, like we they, could they, have they totally more specialized. They they totally do tell you. That what you're what you're confusing maybe is a pretty printing versus whatever. There is a control flow graph here completely, and it's exactly a thin shim away. You might as well just put accessors around it, and and you have it. And maybe we could add some more visualization to show. You know. Okay, this, well, anyway. This guy here, um, I, I, this is a printing as if it's a basic block. And I could doll up the printing a little bit more, and you would be indistinguishable from anyone else's basic block. It's a thin shim away from being just a control flow graph with basic blocks. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The, 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 the way to think about this problem here is that there is a graph there is a collection of instructions within a block. There's, the graph is a, a collection of blocks, and there's a collection of instructions within a block. Two tiers, instructions in a block, block and a graph. That's all available right here. Now I need accessors so that matches maybe what your intuition is. But that's the, the graph is right here. And, and this is a problem. This is where you hit a hot button for me. This is a problem I have with a lot of folks who don't recognize the equivalence between different representations of things modulo a, a slightly naming. So I needed a visit bit and I can use a bit set. I happen to be setting a field one time through things. So the Boolean of that set or not is another way to have a visit bit. I could distribute my visit bit for every in every node and say they have a visit bit per node instead of using a bit set. These are all Equivalent modulo minor renamings and constant factors. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not worrying about the coding stuff. I'm just thinking how we would explain things, right? So that's the thing. Okay. So there's a, a, an obvious uh, uh, control flow graph head tail. Um, there is get the next head, get the tails. There's multiple tails. There's multiple next branches. You have to have an iterator over your output branches to get to the next block because you're defining a control flow graph. There's walk all the members of this basic block. I have all these things. I don't have them under pretty iterator names or under pretty names, but they're all available and I'm using them directly. So we could add names to them and that might, might help people. I don't know. Okay, I'm 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 trying to come around to move away from has to be its own Java class or it's different. To no, no, that's not the real issue. The real issue is that uh, so there are two two issues, right? I mean that's just uh, technicality. The two issues are. Firstly, how do we explain something when it's uh, not exactly what people are familiar with? Well, right? What do you so that's think people are problem. familiar with here? Because so I claim this is familiar. As soon as I said it's a basic block, I everyone I ever worked with would have said, oh, okay. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm coming from a different point of view because all compiler stuff is new to me. Um, but I was familiar with basic block stuff from before. So therefore that's more familiar to me. So that's one thing, how to explain it. And the second thing, which uh, I think uh, we can think about is, does this uh, GCM code need to live in the, in the node, uh, C of nodes package? Can it be moved out? Because to me, it's uh, when somebody is looking at C of nodes, this is noise because this is happening after the C of nodes. Okay, yeah, that, so that we, I saw you hit the Discord in that one. For me, there's like a naming thing going on in you that says, I have C of nodes, I have not the C of nodes. For me, C of nodes is a tool, it's a utility, it's a big hairball of a lot of cool things wrapped up, and that more or less is still more or less there. And the fact that you change the package doesn't change anything. 
no, um, not except the technical. Well, no, yeah. if you extract the code, right, it, it it reduces the load on people to understand it. So, for example, this stuff yeah. is related to scheduling, right? So yeah. it's not used until you kind of end all your peepholes and everything. so having to go through this code, even though it's not being it's not relevant, is just load on anybody trying to understand it, right? But if this code was separate, like okay, in a GCM a, module, right? There's another people issue. Would know, I'm, I'm not going to look at that until I get to scheduling, right? Right. You, you tell them, don't look at it. But let me show you, let me show you another issue here. This code says static and node in. The first argument, and in is used all over. This code would actually rather be in the top level node class and the end becomes the this pointer. Then I get rid of n dot n dot n dot n dot all over it. Yeah, but I would prefer not to do that. And I, I prefer to but... move all of this into a separate class because your code is movable, right? Yeah. I, I, separate I, I, I GCM, really... GCM module where I move all of this stuff out so that then it's not noise that people have to deal with, right? Uh, I don't, well, okay. I, I'm, I'm a little funny about calling it noise. When I say noise, I mean like it's when you're looking at, say, the parsing or the yeah. so, so that's the this thing is the information that you don't need. Each right. each of these things they're instrumental to to uh, to a some whole. There is no core of nodes, a CF nodes. Each tool right. is designed to to complement the the other set of tools in order to achieve the best result. So it will be hard to to strip something and call it the sea of nodes because each uh, technique is a uh, on its own, but the magic happens when you combine all of them. No, I, I get that. You no, know, but even well, if you look at say C two, you will see that the GCM code is separated out, right? Uh, some of it and some of it. Th there's a different breakdown here. What, what I was trying to point out with the static method has a node as the first parameter as that's a common pattern i've put through here so that it's not in the node class because mm -hmm. which is a I good decision it, i think <laughs> i would put it in the node class as a way to just reduce the overhead of looking at all of the thousand in dots that are going on same thing for this guy here but if, if you did that, if you did that, now the node class would be saturated with all yeah. the stuff. And then, and then the node class people... gets big. So, yeah. so I'm not saying no here, but I am saying we are making a conscious decision to take some pile of code, which is very clearly node class dependent, and moving it into another package. Hmm. And, and I'm not saying no to it. I'm just saying that's an interestingly, it's, it, it, no. I, I, I cannot... So eagerly justify that one. Hmm. No, you may even imagine that it's not a separate package. It's a GCM class, right? So then you know, okay, all this is related to GCM. So, so you put it in a GCM class as a private, not, not private, an abstract class whose only purpose is to gather things together. So on the other side, I could see what the BN is trying to say. It's trying to isolate the slice yeah. of functionality in order yeah. to be some kind of plug-in plug yeah. system, if you will. And yeah. it will boil down to the rewrite of the graph because the graph is kind of sh shared framework for all the optimizations. So if, if, I, can if, press if, that. if I look at CFG node mm -hmm. and I remove the scheduling stuff from it, it still exists, it has a useful purpose, but it's like five lines long. Exactly. And so then anybody who's not looking at scheduling doesn't have to understand all this stuff, right? Fine. All that's, right. That's the I, argument for it. I, I, anyway. will, I will agree in theory, but I'll also claim uh, this decision consciously takes things that really belong in a node like, you know, is back edge. Uh, it probably actually probably belongs on out. This one probably does belong on CFG. I should probably make that one a CFG <laughs> class. Um, fine. But a lot of these that just say, you know, static and node parameter, you would otherwise, if I was to be an enterprise Java writing kind of guy, I would say, why aren't they in the node class? <laughs> I bet you there's a refactoring available in IntelliJ somewhere that would just 
flip this node to be the this pointer and get rid of the static and move it over and it'll be done. If you had a language with mix-ins, then you could solve the problem very I'm easily. I'm going to shoot the mix-ins, yeah. but Cameron's <laughs> not here. I am currently in a hate relationship with mix-ins, not a love-hate, just a hate. <laughs> why do why do you hate him? Why, what's what's the problem? Well, because he's asking me to go go convolute them into making valid Java classes. Hmm. Mm. And and I think there's a reasonable way to go there, and it's just mm. it just makes life complicated. And I look at all the number of times <laughs> yeah. Lazy uses mixins. It's like yeah. So uh, it, a will be, a it will care. be really yeah. cool that uh, all of the functionality of CF nodes be separated in a in a in Scala. You can implement this as a Kate pattern because you can each func functionality can declare dependency on another. Uh, what did you call it? What pattern? A cake pattern. Oh, a cake, cake pattern. pattern. So I, I sometime I can demonstrate it, but the, the the gist of it is that you have a separate interfaces, if you will, but each interface can declare its uh, dependency uh, by not in the in the end when you put back the cake. So when you implement all the classes, it, the the abstract functionality just wants to this function, this interface to be implemented and it will be plug and play. So that way you can have a one C of node base functionality and each, uh, each optimization to be in a separate uh, interface, which would be declare a dependency of the CF node base functionality. So no, I'm not I'm not up to having a separate dependency version for handling <laughs> here. So I I'm just um, sharing my thoughts. How can you implement this? It's not the best yeah. thing to to do in Scala. I'm I'm not suggesting anything like that. You know, I'm not even saying that you have to use classes or anything. I'm just saying that the Move stuff that's CFG. not the, exactly yeah. because I, I, it's I not relevant. I, it's not I'm, relevant for somebody who's working yeah. on the say people. Yeah, I, I understand. Or I, I'm okay with it. It just it is going to. I would have done something different, but I guess I don't like it in the node class either. It's just too much. So yeah, yeah exactly. Fine. So if you look at your AA node yeah. class, it's yeah. humongous, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then then you don't know what is relevant for which purpose, and then yeah. it's a, it's a lot of stuff people have to understand. Fine. That's that's all I'm. It is a reasonably separable piece of algorithm compared to the peoples. And it's not a people, and people are not scheduling, so it makes sense that it breaks out here. Well, okay. Now I'm getting hungry here. That was a very good session. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah, and Thalia, thanks yeah. for the update on the older chapters. That was there was a lot of stuff there. Yeah, I'm sure there will be a lot more as I run through the old chapters and porting them to us. Ah, well, thank you. Yeah, be nice. Um, and then and then there's the array list thing you can do, which I don't know. Where yeah, so I think if one. you've got a real use case for it, you should have you should add the implementation because previously we didn't have a good use case for it, right? Well. I knew it was coming, but I didn't think it would. But if it, if it's now if now you have a good use case where it's going to simplify the code, then yeah. that makes it it's worth like, it, right? It's for a stupid reason too, I, you know, I can't add a, a, an output constant to the start node in the middle of finding infinite loops without blowing a CME. So yeah, I so I think it's justified in this case because it really removes okay. that extra. Data structure, right? So it's... well, that means when does that change happen? We're not backporting that change. We could, we could do, um, but let's do it here in this chapter, and then we'll see whether we need to backport it. We could yeah. do backport. We could backport. Would it, it matter, sir? Yeah. yeah. Theory says it'll just be a handful of accessors in Node, and it will be done. Okay. Um. To me, you know, it's clarity of code is very important. So we're trying to teach people. So the more clear it is, the better. Yeah, there were a lot of weird hacks that came in specifically to dodge CME right at the end there that I don't like. Yeah. Fine. And the fundamental thing here is you have you are not able to use the control slot. Now that's a and that's that to me is a significant disadvantage, right? So well, uh, no, I can use the control slot. That wasn't 
maybe there were several different CMEs that were blowing on me. It might have been one of them. Okay. The one that I remember that that threw me over the edge. I, I rewrote several loops out of their natural style to dodge them. And then this last guy blew me over the top and I was like, done. I have to do some screwball thing. Okay. Um, and that turned into a whole lot. I, I threw in a pre-cooked zero and a pre-cooked X control who have no output uses because they're keeps as in the parsers keeper notion. But then I have to do a null check when I go schedule them, but they never should be scheduled because they're just there to fill in for whatever. And now I'm ranting. Fine. Yes. Oh, what tangled webs we weave. So, yeah. So I think it makes sense uh, to get rid of all, right. all that well, noise, will, you know. I will take a look at another time and we'll see if it looks. And I can move them, move those things over to a, a code motion class. I mean, that's how I do it in AA even. Um, because the node class got big. I was just looking at this like, it's all in dot, in dot, in dot. I should have it node. No, no. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I lost my voice. It's good talking to people. Till next week. Bye. Yes, Bye. thank you. Bye.